Hi, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We have a bit of a double header today, uh, but thank you for, for joining us in the lunchtime slot. If you're uh, in the US, uh, South America, or if you're in Europe, it's an afternoon. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for coming for the talk, uh, Dusting Latin Type History Number Two, with Sebastian Morgan. My name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors in the Type of Kerber program, which is hosting today's talk. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, Type of Cooper is a postgraduate certificate program, um, the core of which is the study of typeface design through its extended and condensed programs. We also have workshops and lectures, and we also uh, put together the Typographics Festival, which is coming up this year in mid-June. Uh, you can get all the information uh, and details about the program on the website, coopertype.org. Um, we do have one more talk, as I mentioned tonight. Um, there is uh, the second part of the Cranbrook design event. Uh, so you can get your tickets for that. Uh, I just pasted uh, that into the chat. Um, it's a continuation of conversation about the history and legacy of the design in Cranbrook. So that will close out the uh, spring lectures. And we will have, of course, more lectures in the summer when we pick back up in June. So keep an eye on emails, subscribe to the emails, uh, keep an eye on social media and uh, on the website to see what else is coming up. Um, the talk is being recorded. Um, and if you need to um, run for any reason, you could save the link, which is in the top left corner. Just click the YouTube link. We're, we're live streaming there. So if you need to like jet out, you can always like scrub back and, and watch the remainder of the talk, but we will have a video archive or, or sorry, um, we will add this video to our extended archive. And um, I wanted to thank uh, Type Culture for allowing us um, to be, uh, be able to record this lecture and to add it to our growing digital archive of past lectures. Type Culture is a digital type foundry and an academic resource for all things relating to typeface design. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource. So we hope you can check it out. So thanks again to Type Culture. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Sebastian Morligam. Sebastian is a teacher and researcher at the ESAD, the Amiens School of Art and Design in France. He's also a founder of Bibliothèque Typographique collection for the Ypsilon Editeur. Sebastian has co-authored several books, including the wonderful books on Jose Mendoza Almeida and on Roger Escafon. Uh, amazing books. If you are lucky to get your hands on those, um, you're, you're in good company. Um, if you don't, try to find them. They're wonderful books. He's written many articles and has curated several conferences and exhibitions on the graphic design, typography, type design. He holds a PhD from the University of Reading in the UK. And I believe this is Sebastian's third talk for us, if not fourth. So it's, it's wonderful to have him back. Um, and if you missed the first part of uh, the Dusting Latin Type History talk, I will post the link to that talk in the chat. Uh, you can see the recording of that at the, at the link. With that, I will let Sebastian take over. Sebastian, thank you so much for being with us again one year after. Hello, hello, Cara, hello, Sasha. Thank you for inviting me uh, again. Okay, I guess it's time to share my screen and to start this thing. Um, right. So, um, so as you as you said, this is the the, the second part. Uh, so the, the topic is quite different um, from last year's, even though there are some connections, uh, as you will figure out. Um, as usual, I would like to thank all these people for their kind help in um, assuring that I would be able to, to show you all these things um, today. Um, so just a reminder, so um, two years and a half ago, I was in Ataipa in Tokyo and I gave a talk that is recorded, I think it's on YouTube. And this was somehow the introduction of my research. Uh, I've been working for many years uh, on this topic that is uh, yeah, quite special, uh, sans serif in France. 
Uh, and the more I research, the more I find things. So today I'm not going to expand uh, this introduction in a large uh, buffet. Uh, I'm going to focus on several small aspects uh, that I've been working on in the past uh, months. Um, and I, I hope that you will find it interesting. So I will start actually where basically I ended last time with this uh, very early example of uh, sans serif bold uh, letter forms. Um, just to remind you that mm, the past is full of surprises and the more you dig, the more you are likely to find amazing things that uh, are able to change your views and to improve uh, a narrative on letter forms. So it's a perpetual work in progress. And um, even if you happen to be in a specific time and place, uh, sometimes you just have to, to look for things elsewhere. And this is extremely uh, enlightening uh for uh, how can i say that to get out of the um typographic uh ecosystem and to look in any aspects of letter form making so yeah so sometimes just on a single piece of spanish pottery uh you can have this uh surprise and then it can help you to uh, reconsider uh what you knew before. So every day, basically, uh, you have to, to change uh, your approach when you are researching the history of letter forms. <clears throat> um, just uh, as a reminder, the 18th century was uh, an amazing time uh, for rediscovering sans serif letter forms. Um, many artists, architects from, um, I would say, high society uh, in Europe were able to travel and to uh, look at the inscriptions in the ruins in Rome or in Greece. And um, step by step, uh, they considered that the archaic uh, Latin alphabet was uh, the purest form of the alphabet and then they started to interpret these letter forms um, so i'm not going to tell this whole story actually um, because it has been already told um, by james mosley for several decades so uh, if you don't have a copy of this great book uh, please you can do a good deed and you can order a copy uh, on the shop of Sinbride uh, Library. Uh, and then you will know everything you need to know uh, on this subject. Um, and then I will switch straight to the late 1820s um, in England. <clears throat> and starting with uh, the first uh, sans serif bold uh, typefaces that were made at the time, um, mostly for posters advertising. <clears throat> Also, just to give you uh, some tracks, and then you can consider which are the possibilities of uh, comparing uh, the early uh, sans serif letter forms uh, from the UK with the French ones, because obviously there is a strong connection between both countries. Here are some examples of these early uh, stone series for the Figgins foundry or grotesque for the Foragood foundry. There are many other examples. So I will just show you these ones that are really made uh, to strike the eye uh, in the street. So basically for posters. Um, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, uh, business uh, started again to uh, the United Kingdom and the continent and British types, amazing British types uh, started to appear uh, in France. Uh, for instance, in 1818, the Royal Printing Office bought some, some types and matrices from a couple of uh, British foundries. And um, I wanted to show you this example because it is very striking. You may know some of these typefaces. 
they were used uh, for uh, a kid book and printed by Jules Lido from obviously from the Lido family. And um, I made a small research and I found out that um, several of these typefaces were bought uh, from the Castlon and Cafe Wood and Castlon and Livermore foundries in the early 1820s. So you can see, for instance, that you have uh, the wonderful Italian in this size uh, that is in use, uh, not only for the title page of this book, but inside because uh, it's a uh, children's book and it's a type specimen at the same time. <clears throat> so it's clear evidence that uh, French printers, possibly French founders, uh, were buying types uh, from British founders. So on the one hand, uh, there was a clear use of these new types, at least they were new in France in the 1820s. Uh, and um, there were also types made in France uh, in the style uh, of these British types. Uh, so here, here is an example of, of a poster and you can see that we already have uh, fat faces, uh, French fat faces, and also slab serifs, uh, antiques. And during the 1820s, so there was a huge increase of these new styles uh, in printed matter in France. And obviously some printers were not very happy because for them it was a, a sign of decadence uh, and it would corrupt French printing. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce you to a specific aspect of my research, and that is uh, advertising in the newspapers. So um, at the end of the restoration uh, in March 1827, uh, the government decided to increase uh, the price for the postal rates uh, quite significantly, actually. So the newspapers, all the newspapers, at least that were uh, published in Paris, decided to increase their size so they could add more content and uh, uh, use this extra space for uh, more advertising. So here you have a, an example from 1828, and then you can see that uh, we have some uh, bold um, faces in use uh, to, um, how, how can I say that, to bring some distinction. Uh, and at the time, uh, the, the last page of the newspaper, most newspapers uh, uh, had four pages. So the, the fourth page became the space for advertising de facto. And it's very interesting to see that there was a clear connection between uh, tie faces for posters and their counterparts for these hats. So here you can see uh, uh, an example of a short-lived um, newspaper that intended to uh, reproduce posters in the street and to adapt them inside as hats. So, Imagine that uh, they wanted to attract a new readership. Uh, and it's funny because in the, the prospectus of this uh, newspaper, it is said that basically you will have to go out. You can see the posters from your couch. <clears throat> and they would collect uh, some examples and got in touch also with some uh, possible customers. So they could have uh, the, the, how can I say, uh, the had um, matching with the poster inside this uh, newspaper. Um, but unfortunately for them, it didn't work. Only two, two issues uh, were printed. But then it shows that there's uh, an influence of the poster on the design of the ad. So uh, I've been looking at many newspapers from the late 1820s to the mid 1840s, just to try to monitor the development of the design uh, of the small ads. So here, for instance, this is uh, an example from the, the day before the beginning of the, the revolution, actually in 1830. And then you can see that um, things are quite uh, okay. Uh, it's not a visual revolution from the start. So for, for instance, you have the ads uh, staying in their own column. 
And two years later, things are beginning to change, uh, meaning that some ads would occupy the space of, of two columns, for instance, as you can see here uh, on the left. And uh, there is also the introduction of wood engraved ads. So on the one hand, um, new types were introduced to set these ads. And on the other hand, uh, newspapers would uh, commission made to measure uh, wood engraved ads. And so some of them are really unique and some of them of course were, were stereotyped. So they could be used in many newspapers. And I wanted to show you this nice example that I really was very lucky to, to find it because it's an ad for a type foundry. And you may know this type foundry, Laurent et de Berny. Uh, so it's quite ironic to, to see uh, an ad for a type foundry uh, wood engraved. And um, it's the only example I, I found so far. Possibly there are other examples of this specific hat. So we are in 1832 and uh, the business is slowly taking off and becoming successful. <clears throat> so step by step, year by year, you can see there's uh, on the one hand the type ads and the other hand the wood engraved ads. And there are many, many creative letter forms uh, that were um, made in the wood engraved ads. Some of them are quite close uh, to typefaces like this one, for instance, but it's a fish anglaise. And some are more into a known territory like this one. So um, it gave me uh, the, how can I say, the desire to know more, of course, uh, uh, on this aspect and researching uh, wood engravers or uh, wood engraving workshops. So the more you look into the things, the more you can see tiny details. So here's another example from 1833. And here, if you look closely, first, of course, you, you have to admire the skill uh, of the person who engraved this hat, and especially these very beautiful and fluffy uh, fat sans serif. Uh, but then here below, you notice that there are some names, uh, Andrew, Best, et le Loire. And then when I discovered this hat, that, that rang a bell because uh, Andrew, Best, uh, et le Loire, uh, was one of the most famous uh, wood engraving workshop in Paris between 1832, the date opened, and I would say the mid 1840s. So here's an example for, uh, of their work. But basically, they would work with uh, artists, uh, graphic artists, illustrators. And um, so it was quite a surprise to find out that they were also doing small jobs uh, for advertising. The more you discover things, the more you want to discover, uh, and then it can lead you to uh, unexpected uh, path. So here, as you can see, uh, there's this now a familiar combination of type ads and wood engraved ads. And here at the bottom, you can see the Fenaki stick up, very simple hat. So you, you might wonder what is a Fenaki stick up? So it is very puzzling because as you can see, it's, it's these are sans serif letter forms. And this is a Fenaki stick up. So um, in the late 1820s, the, the Belgian Joseph Plateau invented this device uh, that is based on retinal persistence. Basically you have a series of round plates that you can turn with uh, this handle. And in this case, um, this version of Plateau's device was um, made uh, and sold in Paris uh, in the early 1830s by Alphonse Giroux, <coughs> who would be also famous for selling the first daguerreotype camera at the end of the decade. And what I like also uh, about this example, it is an amazing find uh, to have this box that would have Kept, been kept uh, uh, for so many, so much time. And you can see that the letter forms are quite matching the ones uh, with the ads. And here again, this is another 
uh, version of this Fenakistikop. And again, beautiful uh, box cover and the letter forms are really, really in, in the same spirit uh, as the ones I just showed you in the ads. So it's very interesting to see this relation between one single uh, small uh, wood engraved ad and then matching the product actually. Okay, back to type. So, so far, this is the first sans serif uh, typeface that was made in France. Uh, so this is a single sheet that was uh, bound with an earliest version of a type specimen from the Henri Didot Fondry or the Fondry Polyamatip. Uh, in 1834, the business uh, it was now, now owned by Marcelin Legrand and Plasson, who was a printer. Uh, so there are a few copies uh, known uh, having this sheet uh, in the world. Uh, I'm grateful uh, for knowing it thanks to John Lane and also to Sarah Soskolnit for providing me an early image of this typeface. Actually, these are the only two sizes that were made by the foundry, roughly nine points and 16 points. So it's a unusual design uh, and it's very puzzling because if we uh, accept the year 1834 and, and somehow uh, if we try to, to look uh, a possible influence, well, there is uh, another typeface from the same year, but uh, published by For a Good. Uh, and it's much smaller, it's an eight point typeface. And then you can notice the concept is quite the same, but the execution is very different. Uh, this is slightly bolder, but this is exactly the same idea. But um, yeah, so I, I would think that this may have influenced the design of the Lettre Centre, uh, but the British uh, influenced the French one, but I'm not so sure. And, and then researching becomes very tricky because uh, nothing is stable. There's no evidence. Uh, I think this is the first one, but I'm not even sure that I'm, and especially that is even more uh, ironic again, is to find uh, the two French lettres centrées here, 16 and nine point, uh, in a Henry Caslon specimen 10 years after they were introduced in France. And we know that uh, the Henry Caslon foundry uh, had some, had bought some matrices from French foundry. So this is a clear evidence. So something that may have originated from the UK to France is coming back to the UK. So lots of fun to, to, to rebuild, I would say, the, the, the whole uh, type market in Europe at the time. It is interesting, uh, and so far, this is the earliest example I, I found still in the newspaper, still in an ad, and you can see it's quite massive, uh, of a uh, bold, uh, slightly condensed uh, sans serif. And um, I found it in another newspaper, but I cannot say at the moment uh, who cut this, if it's a wood type, or if these letters were cut, uh, especially on purpose. So uh, that's another mystery to solve. And, uh, you can see that the design is very sharp. Uh, there's no hesitation. And so far, this is the first uh, example of this uh, aesthetic direction in French sans serif. And, and the only closest example coming from the UK uh, would be, in my point of view, this, but you may know, uh, that is one of the first uh, sans serif uh, coming in the 1830s uh, in the UK, uh, with, uh, as you can see, a, a lower case. So, yeah. Um, at the moment, I, I cannot assess if, for instance, this may have been uh, an influence uh, on this design. Uh, 
And I've never seen uh, any other example of this design, uh, for instance, in, in a smaller size. So maybe I find someday more example of this design. In 1835, uh, Le Tam Tam uh, started as a free uh, publication dedica dedicated um, on adver for advertising. So it's full of cheap uh, writing and lots of ads, and it's another treasure trove to, to look for uh, engraved uh, ads um, like this one, for instance. So we are in 1835. And that's very puzzling again, because uh, such designs would only appear on these wood engraved ads, and they don't have any type uh, version. So there's a lot of examples of sans serif letter forms that you can find uh, again in these in these wood engraved uh, ads. And look and cross referencing the newspapers, looking at the ads. When you begin to 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 think, okay, is it a style? Is it the same hand? We can do uh, this uh, slightly. Uh, and launch some serif letter forms, and these ones are uh, condensed. So step by step, it may be possible to create some kind of uh, of corpus uh, of letter forms appearing only in newspapers, uh, and then that would give, I guess, uh, an overview on what was happening at the time uh, in France. Um, not everything is in the type specimens, basically, as you, you know already. And there are very strange uh, letter forms uh, sometimes, like this one, that exist in, in several versions. So maybe it's the same hand who decided to go for this, um, I don't know, it looks like melted candle wax, basically. And so it's for Notre Dame de Paris. And there's a smaller version of this uh, woodcut lettering. And sometimes there are even stranger experiments like this one. So I guess this was made uh, mixing type and, and stereotype. Uh, and this is really, uh, yeah. Uh, puzzling, uh, again, uh, to understand the idea uh, between this very raw, crude execution. Uh, and you will have another example of, of the sans serif letter forms filled with information uh, in, inside. In 1836, it looks like many foundries in Paris uh, began to produce this kind of uh, boards on serif. So we still have uh, capital letters at the time. There are no uh, lower cases, even though um, some examples of sans serif lower case can already be found. And for instance, if you look closely uh, at these uh, series of ads, it's toujours still in the tam tam. Um, so here we have one clear design and the same that is in used uh, for the nameplate of the, the newspaper. And you have one, two, three, four different uh, sans serif typefaces and three different styles. And these, for instance, are clearly inspired by uh, British models. Um, so it is safe to say that in 1836, uh, more sans serif types uh, were produced. And this is the same uh, bold sans serif I just showed you in use uh, for uh, another journal. And uh, in 1836, so this example uh, has the date on, on the top right. So this comes from Laurent et de Bernie, again, uh, thanks to John Lane, who uh, attracted my attention to, to this example. Um, 
there are two things to notice. So these uh, outline sans serif, but uh, are beginning to appear in the same year, 1836. And here you can notice that this is uh, the lettre centré uh, from the Marcelin Le Grand Foundry. So this is the biggest size, the 16 point. So uh, one can assume that Marcelin Le Grand sold some matrices to Laurent et de Berny. And then the, the, the head scratching uh, issue comes because if you don't know that this type uh, was made two years before, you, you can easily go for uh, giving the credit to Laurent and de Berny, but that's not the case. So research is full of pitfalls. And so far, uh, the earliest uh, outline sans serif or sans serif as it is uh, named here, may come from uh, Blake and Stephenson uh, in Sheffield uh, around 1833, but there are other examples in specimens from Figgins and later from Thorogood. But um, this one seems to me the closest match if you look at the, the design uh, of the G, for instance, uh, like this one, because if you, you look at uh, the other examples, uh, these are quite different. And very interesting design, uh, again, from Marcelin Le Grand, uh, this uh, italic outline that only exists in this size. This is a 14 point size. Uh, so far, I didn't find any examples of this typeface in use. So it was shown in, in several specimens of the Marcelin Le Grand uh, foundry. So I don't think that this one uh, was influenced by uh, a British model because I, I don't know any British uh, model like. Um, in March 1838, uh, a new um, newspaper appeared, the Journal Special de, de la Typographie, uh, and Basically, uh, this was made to advertise uh, the foundries. So twice a month, you would get a new uh, issue. And um, for every issue, uh, new types would be used for setting this part. Uh, and in this number, the typefaces uh, are provided by uh, Marcelin Le Grand. So you may recognize again here uh, the, the 16 point of the lettre centré here. And in page four, you have an example of this uh, outline italic I've just shown you. So the, 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 the design of this uh, newspaper was always the same. Um, in the last page, you would have a, a specimen uh, of a different foundry. And uh, in June 1838, another example from the foundry E. Egale. Uh, and this is an important uh, example because it shows uh, a sans serif here, as you can see. But this is the first time that it is named antique. Um, so one can assume that around 1838, the name antique uh, would be in use uh, in the foundries. But it's quite confusing because um, in British foundries, uh, antique would uh, be used for slab serifs. And uh, so obviously the name uh, is quite clear uh, to reference the, the antiquity. And the same year in 1838, so this is a dated specimen from uh, the Duclosel and Company foundry. Uh, on this single page, uh, there are four different uh, sans serif cuts. And again, we can see that they are named antique. And the following year in 1839 uh, from the Fondry General uh, that was managed by Tarbet, uh, we have six different cuts. They are named Initial Antique Noir. And that is quite confusing because 
Obviously, this one can be considered a, as bold uh, sans serif, but these ones are uh, absolutely not. Um, and then also you can clearly see that their design is more related to the archaic Latin alphabet. Uh, it's a completely different approach. And again, this can be matched with uh, several typefaces made in the late 1820s, early 1830s uh, in the UK, coming from Figgins, for instance. Uh, but if you look into this uh, type specimen, you can find uh, in the Greek section, the Greek counterparts, these are the same sizes, nine and, and 12. Uh, so it looks like uh, the Greek and the Latin were cut together. Uh, and uh, when uh, the, the catalog was printed, there was the necessity of um, bringing these typefaces under the same name, antique. One can, could argue that these ones are the real antique, of course, because they, they relate to this archaic alphabet. Um, and in this case, it was used, uh, especially in the massive Paleographie Universelle of uh, Joseph Balthazar Silvestre, printed by the Dido Brothers. And you may recognize uh, the Dido typeface that was made by Joseph Viber uh, for Pierre Dido um, 30 years before, uh, at least. Um, so there is uh, a research uh, to, to make uh, on this level of sans serif, these sans serif types that were made for uh, paleographic books, for instance. And here is another example that is lesser known. Uh, this is cut by Marcelin Legrand again, and this was cut for the Royal Printing Office. And at the time, Marcelin Legrand was doing a lot of work uh, uh, and adapting a lot of different scripts uh, for the Royal Printing Office, uh, and he was also managing his own business. Um, so very nice letter forms. Back to the ads, back to the wood engraved ads. So the, as I said, the more you research, the more you focus on some detail, and then you can notice that there are uh, quite a handful of styles for these letter forms. Uh, and Again, some forms that you don't find as typefaces, uh, but they are quite popular uh, on, in these newspapers. And you can admire the skill of the engraver because this is completely engraved by hand. And here you can notice there's a name signature, Alain. I will shortly go there. And looking in other examples, so again, you can see that the mix of wood engraved ads and, and type ads uh, is familiar now. Um, this was scanned from uh, micro, so it's, it's a bit crude, but you can see that there are some very nice attempts uh, at sans serif flower case uh, in these hats. So, and, and very interesting uh, questions can arise. Um, I wonder if these sounds uh, lowercase uh, could have been done, uh, I would say, from studying modern faces, for instance, um, type faces by Dido and over. So that's a question because you can see that there's a high contrast between the thick and fins. So in the early 1840s, uh, it's quite messy. As you can see, so more sans serifs are being used uh, in the ads and it's going to rise uh, along the decade. And uh, again, there, there's some kind of competition uh, with the wood engraved ads, but these are quite marvelous again. So especially these two close to each other and um, you can admire again the, 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 the width of the engravers and also uh, these uh, over sans serif uh, minuscule um, Roman and Italic. And so I wonder if uh, in studying this letter form, there may be uh, possibilities to revive them. And, and imagine at the time if some foundries 
have decided to make uh, versions of these letter forms, the history of typography may have been slightly different. And then that makes me wonder uh, what happens at the same time in other countries in Europe. Uh, and again, there's the name, the same name, Alain, uh, on the right side. And here you have an address, Quai de l'Ecole 12. And I, when I found this address uh, on this wooden grave, uh, ad, uh, I knew who Alain was. Um, in the 19th century on Le Pont Neuf in Paris, uh, there were several shops selling uh, stencil. Uh, at, there were at least two shops uh, open on these small buildings here on the bridge. But this building uh, was the building where Alain uh, was operating. Uh, so Alain was uh, an engraver on metal and was also selling uh, stencil. Here you can see in this other photograph the same building. And with a little zoom, we can almost read Caractère à jour. That was the name, the French name in use at the time for uh, stencil letters, uh, stencil plates. And here, Alain Graveur sur métaux. And these are, you have two medallions here. And the shop was open for several decades, at least uh, if the date of this Marville photograph is correct, uh, until the late 18. 70s. Here's the shop here. The medallions has disappeared. You can see in the neighborhood also that uh, sign painted sans serif uh, are prominent now. And depending on the quality of the digitization uh, of the photograph, you, you can almost see what Alain was selling uh, in his shop here uh, in the window. So that's very frustrating because uh, I know many people would be happy to visit such a shop today. Time travel doesn't exist, unfortunately. Back to the newspaper, back to the fourth page. Um, some wooden engraved ads uh, were quite elaborate uh, as, you, as you can notice in this example. Uh, so this is very interesting. Um, because uh, there are several versions of these ads. Uh, it was uh, made with wood modules and you could uh, expand or reduce the size depending on how much space uh, uh, you could buy uh, if you were Edsel, the publisher in newspaper. Uh, and then you can notice that now the sans serifs are, are quite prominent as well. Um, so this is a general advertising uh, for books for the beginning of the next year, which is called the Etren. It's after Christmas. So it was uh, quite popular at the time uh, to advertise uh, old and new books uh, for uh, readers that were likely to buy them. And very likely the, the, the book that uh, comprises uh, as much as possible typefaces made uh, at the time in France is Un Autre Monde. Uh, it's a book by uh, the famous graphic artist Granville uh, with a text by Taxil Delors. So here is the, the cover uh, of the first uh, part of the book. And it, it must be said that the book was published by Henri Fournier. And Fournier was trained uh, as a typographer in the 1820s uh, at the Dido uh, printing office. And he became a publisher in the 1830s. Um, and this book is really uh, wonderful for many reasons. But if you consider it only uh, on the typographic level, uh, there are plenty of faces that come from uh, the best Parisian foundries, from Marcelin Legrand, from Laurent et de Bernie, from the Fondry General. So it's a hidden massive type specimen. And it's quite uh, interesting to see this care for uh, choosing uh, all these typefaces. Uh, and especially the, the, when some images made by Granville are, are matching, 
um, the mood of this sans serif. So I would advise you to have a look at, at this book. Uh, there's a good digitized version on Gallica, uh, the, the website of the, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, because it's a really wonderful book. Um, you will have lots of fun. Okay, well, I, I will almost uh, finish my talk. Uh, I, I just want to say that um, some of these images uh, can be found in this book that was just published uh, by the Edition Non Standard. So I'm, okay, I wouldn't say I'm the author of this book, but uh, I selected uh, all these images to build a, a visual essay um, simply because I couldn't do it any other way. Uh, and I thought that uh, as a starting point, uh, I would say as a publishing, sharing my research, uh, trying to build a, a series of uh, sequences uh, through images was uh, possible. Um, I hope to, to write a, a, a substantial book on sans serif letter forms in France. Uh, but as you know, the, the more you, you look for things, the, may, uh, you, the more you, you, you know, uh, sorry, the more you discover new things. Uh, and um, so I, I, I will publish a few articles before. But in, in this first book, uh, you can find an example of sign painting. Uh, also, lots of letter forms made uh, through the lithographic process and, and in illustration. And um, of course, uh, sign painting is quite prominent in, in Paris and in other French cities at the time. And in a single example like this one, uh, taken from a, a photograph by Charles Marville, uh, you can see all the variety uh, of sans serif letter forms. And some were possibly inspired by models in ads, for instance, or lithography and some were uh, made on the spot by design painters. So if you want to get a copy of this book, uh, you just have to go on the website of the Edition Non Standard. Uh, and uh, I will be very grateful if you do it uh, because it's a great book. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I just uh, posted the link um, to the publisher, but let me just uh, post the link to the book itself. Which is very, very, very great. Very, very exciting. Um, so we're going to do a Q&A session. So if folks have questions, um, do send them in. I'm sure uh, there's some really interesting things that came up that you are probably curious about. So we'll um, give you a little bit of chance to, to go into that. And to get the stuff started, I uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, it's always like really, really exciting to see the stuff that you're, you're finding and the insight that you share. So thank you for that, Sebastian. Um, uh, one of the things that, that sort of st stuck in my mind as you were presenting, like the the sources, right? Like the, and maybe you could talk about like um, what's, what, what led you um, to be able to do this sort of research. Is it, I mean, one, uh, Gallica has an amazing digital collection. Are you finding more um, newspapers or or like, was there something that prompted you to, to dig into those newspapers to start looking for these? Were they always there? Is this a recent addition to Gallica? Um, thank you. Uh, and first of all, I would like to apologize for my shitty, sorry, my rusty English. <laughs> um, I should practice more. Um, yeah, there are always new things coming up in Gallica. Uh, so basically you would spend your lifetime uh, if you wanted to. Uh, looking into this thing. I guess uh, one of the few positive aspects of the corona pandemic was I had time to spend online. And uh, I've been collecting for years, but uh, for several months, I really, really looked into many, many uh, 
museums, uh, libraries, uh, websites. And then I realized that there's always new things uh, being added to um, these uh, digital collections. And again, it's difficult to un um, to untangle the threads when you realize that all these things are so intricate. And um, as I said at the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, not everything is about type. Uh, and uh, for me, it's obvious that uh, type design in France, if I can use this word, in the 1830s uh, is not the most creative way of making new letter forms. Um, because um, uh, at first, uh, type French type founders had to, yeah, to digest the British influence. Uh, and if you look in type specimens uh, in the 1840s, there are uh, many interesting original designs that were made. Uh, but then you, you realize the more uh, you look into these newspapers, and I just uh, hopefully uh, showed it uh, through these examples that um, wood engravers, but also sign painters and lithographers. I mean, plenty of graphic artists uh, were designing uh, very interesting letter forms, not only sans serif. Uh, and um, so there's a web uh, and it's very difficult to, 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 to pinpoint some examples and to, to assess the, the possible connections. And um, so you, you could see that at the same time, um, French type founders are very slow in developing this sans serif. And at the same time, looking in the newspapers, but also the same can be said about uh, uh, sheet music, for instance, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, amazing uh, letter forms that were made by these graphic artists. And um, so that, that makes me wonder about um, a transnational history of letter forms, because I would like to know what was happening at the same time in Germany, uh, in Italy, in Spain, in other countries. Uh, and again, um, because we have a fair idea of the connections inside the type market between uh, British, French, German foundries, for instance. And uh, if you look closely, you can find uh, some clear paths of business. Uh, between these foundries. But then if you consider how uh, these uh, newspapers, magazine could travel from one country to another, maybe uh, people would have subscri subscriptions uh, from Germany to French newspapers. And then there's this secret uh, buzzing life of letter forms. And it's extremely uh, fascinating but uh, if you start researching these aspects, then yeah, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, as we sort of move into like a, a, a immersive kind of digital experience, and I think with archives sharing more and more, like this connection between countries could be made even further. Because I know Gallica's website, as you said, is 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 just you know you can spend years and years just uh, finding things, and and it's a phenomenally well indexed and just the quality of the images especially the the last uh i know there's like some microfiche there's some some older kind of images that have been added but but a lot of the new stuff is is incredibly sharp incredibly uh beautifully kind of um documented the other thing that made me wonder is um uh and i was was really lovely to see the photographs like the street pho photographs of, of the buildings and of course like the signage itself you know like making that connection is really really great do you find that there's also more material like that that's becoming available kind of uh more photographs especially the the older parisian photos because of course there's the aj photos but there's more than that Ajay. there were other photographers who were, who were active have you seen more images of, of particularly that mid mid 19th century uh, Paris and other cities come up? Yeah, um, um, Gallica has a few, but uh, there is also the, the general website of the Paris museums. And there are plenty, plenty new things that were added in the past two years. 
And um, I mean, some famous photographs like Marville, uh, Adjé, French photographs on the, the second half of the 19th century are quite documented for, for uh, and um, sometimes it's just one single photograph uh, that attracts your attention. And, and then you realize that uh, in this place, at this time, when the year or, or uh, the time period is correct, these letter forms uh, were there in the street. And uh, it's a huge task of cross-referencing what was happening in the street uh, on the level of sign paintings and also letter making because some of these letters were made uh, from wood, from metal. And then step by step, uh, if you imagine uh, creating a, a map of uh, sans serif letter forms at least, uh, but uh, and then attempt to um, compare them to examples uh, in, again, lithographic printing or wood engraving. So what would be, uh, um, how can I say, a fruitful uh, um, endeavor in the sense that uh, it takes time to discover these things. It takes time to look at these things, and especially it takes even more time to create such a map. And um, everything is spread on the internet. Everything is also spread in books. And the more there are books, journals, newspapers digitized, uh, the more the possibilities uh, appear to, to make a better history of letter forms. And it's only on the Latin level, of course, because if you expand the map on the, the whole world, uh, then it gets even more fascinating. And, 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 and there, there are still possibilities of um, improving uh, such a history on the visual level. Uh, and because researching uh, needs also a specific time. Um, for instance, I, 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 I I haven't been in, in real archive institution for years uh, and discovering these names, for instance, the, 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 the wood engravers. Mm -hmm. So I just want to go uh, to the National Archive in Paris and try to find information about these people. So yeah, that would be really, really motivating to, to research these uh, anon almost anonymous or unknown uh, letter designers. And um, I guess uh, also uh, uh, considering making history in um, rebuilding these lives as, as much as possible, it's expanding the narrative. And it's not always about the big names because we, we are somehow, we know enough about the, the big names and we don't know anything about the small names or the no names. Uh, and when what is left only is their work. Uh, and so we realize the more we dig into this, we realize that these people deserve uh, recognition when it's possible to find a name. And uh, so this is where uh, the fun uh, begins, but it's one possibility uh, of expanding this history. So. I would, I don't know, I would have to work with 10 people, uh, maybe to, to give an assignment to each people and say, okay, you're going to see in this, this year, these newspapers, okay, tell me what you found. And, uh, but it's not possible, unfortunately, at the moment. So. I, I'm sure there's a lot of volunteers in, in, in watching this who, who would love an opportunity like that. I think it, I think it sounds wonderful. I think I'll echo what Mark, Maxime uh, Zhukov said in, in, in the chat, bravo. Um, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly admirable. And I think it's an incredibly important task to do that sort of connecting of the dots and bringing everything together, especially reviving the unknown kind of parts of the history, especially the unknown individuals. You know, I think like the, the, the mini example of, of, uh, was it Alain, the, the, the wood engraver that, that you showed, like that, that's a fascinating like discovery to just like think about that, that individual in the history and, and, bring being able to connect those pieces together and to create that like um map you know well, a written map of of, of that history uh, actually just had a question in terms of like um 
the production, the typical kind of production. Like, um, so a lot of these wood engraved ads at the time um, were, um, my assumption prior prior to prior to the stock, I thought that a lot of things like that were done sort of at the newspaper level, where the engravings might have been done. I didn't realize that there's this. Um, extended um, network of, of engraving that you could get an ad engraved and then essentially kind of bring it to the newspaper, right? It's like, so there was this like kind of almost freelance level of, of, of design that happened outside of the newspaper itself, right? Yeah. Uh, um, so I think there are uh, three kinds uh, of ads. The first one is fully typographic. Uh, the second one is more problematic because uh, they are made from wood letters, but it's difficult to 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 find out if these wood letters uh, come from a, a foundry mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or if they were made uh, in a wood cutting workshop or. So, because they don't take, they look like typefaces, but as long as they are not referenced in a type specimen, for instance, or you can find any other example. The, 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 the first examples I showed you from 1835 of this uh, slightly condensed uh, uh, board um, sans serif, it is very striking because you can see it's neat, it's a good quality. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was commissioned uh, by the newspaper or the customer. Uh, obviously a publisher in this case. Uh, and so there are some uh, many changes uh, to, to recreate because um, some of these ads uh, were made to measure very likely. So the first, the, say first, second, third category uh, are the wood engraved ads. Uh, so some of them, um, when I found some unique examples, I assume that they were made uh, especially for one single publication, but uh, again, I can be surprised and maybe in the future find other versions in different newspapers. And others were very likely stereotyped uh, from the wood engraved block. Uh, so they could be reproduced in many newspapers at the same time, and sometimes for years. I mean, over a period of 10, 15 years, we would have the, the same old single tiny wood engraved had appearing. So as, as if, uh, uh, they subscribed a uh, uh, regular publication to the newspaper. And so I, I assume that newspapers would deal directly with uh, workshops or uh, there was in the 1840s, uh, um, some ad uh, agencies uh, were created in, in Paris to deal with all these aspects of selling ads uh, to newspapers and you know making the connection with uh, the clients and so the business was was really really uh, taking off but again the 1830s uh, is is a fascinating decade in France because so much is happening at the same time you see things are are, are changing at a very fast pace uh, when you look at all these uh, documents, um, all this printed matter is just, uh, again, um, I spent these last months uh, in the fourth page of the newspapers uh, in, in my, in, in the margin of my free time. <laughs> um, but um, I started uh, two years ago during the, the first lockdown and I wanted to come back uh, uh, to, to see if there were some other examples, uh, and it can become very obsessive uh, again, because if you, you want to have the first example, uh, but in the future, I don't know when, hopefully next year, I, I hope to resume this part of the research, unless in between something else appear and I have to, to pull out another thread. <laughs> and then we'll have part three. <laughs> for testing mm -hmm. Latin history will be different again. Yes, 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 yes. Um, there's one. Uh, there's two two questions in the chat. One one uh, uh, from Genevieve. Uh, the question is, which uh, characteristics, if any, would you say tend to set French sans serif apart from the English types that may have been modeled upon? Um, any any distinct characteristics between uh, the English and the, the French? I mean, especially in the time period you talk about, they're quite close, right? Because they're essentially being invented at that time. 
Well, then again, it's a matter of looking at, at, at shapes. Um, they, they are quite uh, close to each other, but again, it would be uh, fruitful to select specific examples of British uh, sans serif uh, and French sans serif because some letters can be close, but not close enough. The, I would say along the 1830s, um, there's a clear influence. And then it's slowly shifting in the 1840s uh, because they, they start designing um, new sizes. Um, there's also this trend of condensed sans serif that um, begins in the 1840s in France, but but that started as well uh, a few years before uh, in the UK. Um, so, so these are just a few details, a few features uh, in specific letters. Uh, the balance of thick and thin, um, the, the contrast is quite low um, for the, the bold uh, typefaces made for advertising and posters. There's also a lot of things happening uh, in, in wood type. Uh, I didn't talk about it because uh, uh, there's a clear lack of research and specimen for this period from the 1830s to the 1850s. Uh, we begin to have more frequently uh, wood type specimen in France in the 1860s. Uh, but I don't, I'm, I have to, to do re more research on this level, but I'm pretty sure we, we can find many surprises. So um, yeah, these are specific details uh, on some letters. So it, it's always problematic for me to say, oh, this is French, oh, this is British, oh, this is German, this is Italian, uh, when you decide that this has this kind of uh, feel they were made in this country for sure. And then they, they settled and they were um, copied by um, other techniques and other people. And for instance, uh, after the 1850s, uh, 1860s, if you look at, at type specimens and you see the signage in the street, for instance, then you feel that there's a clear direction in this style of bold uh, sans serif. And uh, I think there's a, there's a clear break after 1870 in France because of the war. Uh, and also uh, because uh, the, the trade, the international trade is changing. And for instance, um, many German typefaces appear in French type specimens in the 1870s, 1890s. Uh, so it's getting more complex because uh, if you don't know but some of these sans serif ever were actually made uh, in Germany, for instance, when you say, oh, this is French as well, but uh, <laughs> and it's not actually because uh, you realize that uh, they, they were sold uh, by, by uh, German type foundries to, to French type foundries. And, uh, so, and I guess this is also one of the reasons at the end of the 19th century, you have the, the, the Peño foundry putting on the market this uh, French modern typefaces made from the drawings of Oriol and Grasset because the Peño wanted to, to, to cut, I would say, this uh, uh, German uh, influence and try to uh, refresh, rejuvenate French type design. Uh, thanks to these Art Nouveau artists. So for me, this is clear. And also there's a lot of resentment uh, from the French, from the French uh, because of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, there's another narrative that is very fascinating. I mean, the, 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 the French German typographic uh, relationship. Uh, so, but maybe <laughs> next year. <laughs> That's another talk, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess also, like I was just thinking about it too, like a lot of the examples you showed, um, the the lowercase sans really shows up in the in the wood engravings, not so much in the in the in the type, right? Even wood type, so it's like it's going to take a little bit of time for the lowercase to fully kind of develop in in cast form, right? Like so, it's predominantly caps, so it's mostly titling, it's mostly display, it's mostly for for headlines, right? Yeah. Um... I would say that uh, there are many examples of uh, uh, sans serif uh, minuscule 
letters uh, appearing in the late 1830s as well uh, in France uh, and, and on posters uh, in some uh, artistic journals. And again, graphic artists are very instrumental in uh, inventing uh, sans serif minuscule. Uh, uh, and this needs more research as well, because there are no conclusions that you can make. You can just notice that, uh, again, these are, I don't know if it, one can consider these as wasted opportunities for type designers, <laughs> because at the time they had all, all, all absolutely other things on their mind. And not uh, looking at this, oh, this is very interesting. Nobody has ever done this uh, sans serif. Uh, small letters, minuscule, etc. And we are going to adapt them as a typeface. Um, and because if I'm correct, I, I, uh, this, this is becoming, uh, uh, sorry, in the, in the 1850s in Germany, this is when we can find uh, the first uh, sans serif typefaces, including lower cases, um, maybe also in the, in the United States. Um, but then finding these examples, these very unknown, modest uh, wood engraved blocks and just uh, thinking about the hand and the, the, the minds, the guy who did that, and say why, yeah, wh why? Because uh, you can see the the, the level of skill, uh, and, and some of these letters are quite beautiful. So I don't know. Maybe someone would should invent some kind of uh, future fonts of the past. <laughs> would be a great concept. <laughs> I love it. Yes, <laughs> someone should do this. And I think we'll just take one last question for me from Yanni in the chat. Uh, the question is: Was there a golden age of early sans serif in France? where you could see that the quality of the letters improved visibly from the very first ones? Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the golden age for me uh, is the 1830s because um, so many things happen. Yeah. Uh, but to say that there was a time in France when sans serif, uh, Types were were great, yeah. Of course, people would say, yeah, 1960s, Excoffon, Anticolive, or 1930s, Peño, etc. So that's an interesting topic. I, I mean, if which are the milestones of French sans serif? Uh, only on the type level, of course. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> Another topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, and and I'll echo uh, John Downer's comment in the in the chat. Thank you for the talk and continue your research, please. I know I know it's uh, <laughs> there's so many things to research, but uh, it's always yeah. really exciting to see the material and, and the research that you bring. And I appreciate your generosity in sharing it to to us and to our students and to the to the audience watching, and hopefully inspires them to uh, go out and do the research, add to the research, and and find more things and share them with others. So thank you so much, Sebastian. Thank you, everybody watching. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Uh, join us tonight for our last talk. And of course, we'll be many, many, many more. And we'll have Sebastian here again sometime soon, I promise. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure. Next year, hopefully. Next year, we'll keep it an annual tradition. <laughs> Number three. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you thank soon. You. Have a great rest of the day.